Nope, it looks like for whatever reason, this is not connecting live to Zoom again. So we're not gonna uh, wait 15 minutes, like 20 minutes like we did last night. And we're just gonna go on with the program. I am recording it at this point. So we will have it up on the library's Facebook page and on cable, Brockton Cable Access um, uh, YouTube channel um, in the next few days. And we'll post that information when it's ready um, on both of those media. So I am gonna share my screen and um, give you a sense of what we're gonna be doing here. So, Um, make sure it's optimized and let me make sure that um, this is all set. Okay, so tonight we've got a really, really special program for you um, as part of uh, the second day of our Family STEM Week and Career Showcase um, that's uh, being presented by the Brockton Public Library and the Brockton Area Branch of the NAACP and it's sponsored by Jacobs. We're really happy to have them on as a, a sponsor this time. Um, and we're gonna be talking about a visit to an asteroid. And uh, in particular, it's the OSIRIS-REx mission, and it's a sample return from the asteroid Bennu. So uh, if you don't know much about asteroids, I'm gonna give you a little bit of information um, and then we're gonna specifically talk about what's happening with the Osiris Rex um, sample return from asteroid Benno, and you're gonna understand what that's all about. Um, and now my slide's not advancing. There we go. All right, so my name is Pat Monteith, if you don't know that, and I am a solar system ambassador for uh, NASA and the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. That means that um, I had to go through a pretty intense selection process. I go through a lot of training in order to make sure that the information that I impart upon anybody who wants to listen to me um, is uh, accurate to the best of my ability to present it that way. And I'm also the author of a book for um, students in grades four through eight for the most part, but younger and older, depending on your reading skills. And it's a book called The Secret Case of the Space Station Stowaways. Um, and it's a great adventure novel um, about, um, oh, well, you'll have to read it to find out, but it has to do with the space station. That's all I've got to say. All right, um, so we're gonna talk about asteroids today. Um, and if you don't know what asteroids are, they're uh, usually made up of rock and metal and um, they orbit the sun like tiny dwarf planets. Um, some of them contain water and chemical materials that scientists believe can create life. And the largest asteroid that we know of is called Ceres um, and it's got a 300 mile radius. Uh, we've been looking for asteroids uh, since the uh, mid 1980s uh, we've uh, had nine different missions uh, go to find asteroids and find out more about asteroids. And as you can see up top, the one we're talking about tonight is gonna be OSIRIS-REx. And I'll explain to you what OSIRIS-REx means, what it's an acronym for. If you know anything about NASA, you know that they love acronyms. So sometimes you have to have a dictionary to be able to figure out uh, what uh, they're talking about. All right, so where do asteroids come from? I think most of you already know that. Um, one of the things that we are going to be doing here is we're going to be um, oops, uh, asking you to put things into the chat window um, when I ask a few questions here. And uh, coming up pretty soon right now, actually, is here's a a picture, a graphic of the solar system with the eight planets that we know of. And no, Pluto is not there because Pluto is not a planet. And we can save that discussion for another night. 
Um, but where do you think asteroids come from? Why don't you, uh, let's tell you, this is gonna be a very interactive presentation. Okay. So um, you can li list your answers in the chat or you're welcome to put your mic on and let me know what the answers are. Where do you think asteroids come from? And I actually just realized I can't see the chat. So my trusty uh, sidekick over there might be able to give me some information that's coming in on the chat. So you might want to um, uh, unmute yourself and uh, come on up with a couple of the answers. Where do asteroids come from? Well, there is an asteroid belt in the middle of um, between Mars and Jupiter. Okay, very good. And that's the answer yeah. I was looking for. There is, there is an asteroid belt and it is located between Mars and Jupiter. Now, some people think that um, past Neptune, where you can see the Kuiper belt, um, that that uh, sometimes results in asteroids um, coming to Earth, but that's actually not true. The Kuiper belt um, has more um, icy material and that's where uh, the comets come from, is up out in the Kuiper belt. Um, but the asteroid belt is where um, asteroids come from. Um, so the question is, why should we care about, or why would we want to hunt for asteroids? Um, you know, aside from the fact, and as I said, a lot of asteroids contain metal, and some of it, some of it is actually very precious metals, and it would um, give me, uh, give us a lot of uh, it would make us a lot of money. Anybody who went hunting for asteroids and brought some back um, would find that um, there's a lot of precious metals there and they're probably very valuable metals. Um, but aside from that, one of the reasons why we want to hunt for asteroids is because asteroids can be dangerous to Earth. And here's a picture of a meteor crater in Arizona. Um, hmm asteroids can cause craters. And in fact, this crater in Arizona is one mile across. It's 550 feet deep. And they estimate that it was traveling 26,000 miles per hour when it hit Earth. And the last time an asteroid this size came close to Earth was back in 1976, probably uh, earlier than a lot of you were born. Um, and the next known approach of such a large asteroid will be in 2028. However, um, I did hear a news story in the last day that um, one of the scientists um, is estimating that, um, actually Neil deGrasse Tyson had said that um, an asteroid about the size of a refrigerator is probably, possibly, maybe, going to hit Earth the day before the elections on November 2nd. Ooh. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Ooh. So um, one of the things that happens is NASA and other organizations actually keep track of near Earth asteroids. And uh, when they come close to Earth, um, then uh, NASA alerts everybody. And then there's a lot of different mitigation strategy, strategies that they have in place. And um, the blue lines here are uh, near Earth asteroid paths. And so scientists keep track of them to make sure that none of them is gonna take out Earth like the asteroid that took out the dinosaurs 65 million years ago. But mm -hmm. again, that's another program. Pat, uh, so in you have a, Pat, you have a question. Okay. Um, uh -huh. What, I have a comment okay. about like, asteroid. What is that? Um, isn't it true that something like uh, asteroid called Anubis is coming to uh, on Earth in 2029 or something like that? Asteroid Anubis? Um, that's Yeah, that's quite possible. We're not going to talk about getting into too much detail about other asteroids. We're just going to focus on Benno for tonight. But... Okay. Um, yeah, you can get some more information about that online, I think. Uh, but I do believe you're true. I, I believe that's true. Um, okay, so we're talking about asteroid Bennu in particular. Um, and 
how big is asteroid Bennu? It's 1,600 feet wide, which is about a third of a mile across in its center. And the circumference of the asteroid is about a mile. Um, it is located 206 million miles from Earth. And um, they think that in about 100 years, asteroid Bennu could come and maybe cause some trouble on Earth. Got a little video for, for you here, um, an overview with the uh, space scientist who's uh, in charge of uh, this asteroid Bennu OSIRIS-REx mission. Um, then we're gonna talk a little bit more about uh, uh, Dante, who's uh, the principal investigator. Asteroid Bennu is a fascinating object. It records our solar system's earliest history, contains information about the origins of life, and has uncertainties in its orbit that leaves a small possibility of impacting Earth late in the 22nd century. These properties make Bennu the perfect target for NASA's OSIRIS-REx Asteroid Sample Return Mission. It's a great adventure to explore an unknown world. We're going to reach out and touch it, and we're going to bring treasure back to Earth for scientific analysis. To me, it doesn't get any more exciting than that. Oh. So um, that was Dante Loretta, and this is what he typically looked like whenever whenever he was working on the OSIRIS-REx um, project. And that's him in what's referred to as a bunny suit. And one of the reasons why all the people who work on equipment that's going to go in space, all the space rockets and whatever, um, is because they want to try to reduce any contamination from you know, humans and, you know, your skin sheds on a regular basis and you might sneeze or whatever. So um, everybody wears, it's re it really is called a bunny suit. Um, anyways, as I said, NASA loves um, uh, acronyms. And so OSIRIS-REx actually stands for a number of different things. Um, and it stands for origins. So uh, did asteroids play uh, a role in delivering organic matter to Earth and help with the origins of Earth. Their spectral interpretation, um, what's in the asteroid, what's it made of. Um, resource identification, does it contain ma material that we can use for fuel, such as water, organics, and precious metals. Um, security, a uh, big one here, as I said, can we prevent an asteroid, this asteroid in particular, from hitting Earth. Um, Bennu is actually classified as one of the most dangerous asteroids, and they're saying it could impact Earth in about 100 years. Uh, so we need to know everything about it, its physical and chemical properties, in case we need to prevent an impact. And then um, the last thing, the Rex, is the Regolith Explorer. And um, that's meant to bring soil back from the asteroid to study in our labs. And a regolith is nothing more than the dirt covering over Earth and the moon and Mars and also asteroids. Um, so one of the things that we're able to do is to characterize asteroids, asteroids remotely using various techniques such as radar astronomy and uh, photometry, spectroscopy, and other tools. And Bennu was actually characterized many, many years ago by all these telescopes so that we knew what the asteroid would look like before we even considered going in that direction. Um, one of the mission objectives is to actually compare our ground-based observations to those that are made by the spacecraft once it gets to, in this case, the asteroid, um, and this will help us determine how well these remote um, methods work. So over on the right-hand side, you see three um, space telescopes, telescopes that are, are actually flying around in space, and that's um, the Spitzer and Herschel and Hubble. And Hubble is the only telescope right now in space that's still currently working. Um, Spitzer was just retired uh, a couple of months ago, actually, I think in January of this year. 
Um, the other five telescopes are located on Earth. Um, the most recent one um, is the Arecibo one, which is up in that top, top row, the second from the left. Um, and that's located in Puerto Rico. Um, and that was bringing back some incredible data. And then in one of the storms earlier this year, um, Arecibo uh, sustained a lot of damage, even though not to the telescope itself, but to a lot of the fittings that holds up things that keep that telescope going. So as I said, these telescopes are do a great job at cat categorizing um, you know, objects in space. And when you take a look at the upper left-hand corner, you'll see what we got for radar da data about asteroid Bennu um, many, many years ago. Um, you know, we saw then that its size was around 500 meters. Um, it was a spheroidal spinning top and its rotation state was in a 4.3 hour period. So where Earth rotates in 24 hour period, um, Bennu rotates much quicker than that. And um, that's actually one of the issues that they um, looked at when they considered whether or not to go forward with uh, landing on or trying to land on asteroid Bennu to take the sample. Um, so why Bennu? Why did out of all the asteroids that are out there, and there's about a half a million in the asteroid belt, um, why was Bennu chosen? The OSIRIS-REx spacecraft was launched with a clear mission, collect a sample from an asteroid called Bennu, and send it back to Earth. But with the number of known asteroids in our solar system reaching into the hundreds of thousands, why was Bennu chosen? What made it the best target? The first set of selection criteria was proximity to Earth. The most accessible asteroids are located around 74 to 153 million miles away. And in that group, the most ideal targets are ones with an Earth-like circular orbit and a low degree of tilt due to spacecraft maneuverability. At the time of selection in 2008, that brought the number of known near-Earth objects down from 7,000 to 192. From there, the size of the asteroid became a factor. Bigger meant better in this case, because asteroids with smaller diameters rotate faster, and material on their surface are more easily ejected, not ideal conditions for safely grabbing a sample. So, mission scientists wanted the target to have a diameter larger than 200 meters. That brought the candidates down from 192 to 26. The chemical composition of the asteroid was the next factor, because we want our return sample to help us learn more about the history of our solar system and life on Earth. That dropped our target list to 12 asteroids with a known composition. And from there, only five of those were ideal for sampling because they are known from Earth observations to be carbon rich. This matters because a carbon rich asteroid may contain organic molecules, volatiles, and amino acids that may have been the precursors to life on Earth. So, now it's decision time. Of these five contenders, why Bennu? Quite simply, it's because there was more information about it available to scientists. It was the only object of the five that had been observed with radar. This provided not just an accurate measurement of its size, dimensions, and shape, but also suggested it has a smooth surface with an ample amount of material to sample and few large boulders to get in the way. We didn't have this level of detail with the others, which put the ability to safely get a surface sample in doubt. Sorry, fellas. The material we gather from asteroid Bennu will help generations of scientists better understand how the planets formed and the source of the organic materials and water that helped spawn life on Earth. And beyond learning about the past, studying Bennu can help us plan for the future. Everything from space travel to utilizing natural resources and better understanding the risks of asteroids. And this is why we chose Bennu. There you go. So I... Uh... Quick review of this, if you take a look at the bottom of the pyramid going up, um, you see that there's about a half million asteroids that are out there in the asteroid belt. Um, of those, 7,000 are near Earth asteroids. Um, 192 of them have the orbits that would be good for a sample return. Um, it has to have a large enough diameter to be able to land on. So uh, uh, NASA said it's gotta have a diameter of more than 200 meters and only 26 of the asteroids uh, fit that criteria. And then um, only five of them were carbon rich. 
And so it came down to five. And as you just saw, um, there's a lot of potential for Bennu being the perfect place to be able to get the information. Okay, so, you know, where did uh, both the name of the spacecraft and the name of the asteroid come from? Um, Osiris in mythology, those of you who are mythology buffs, and I was when I was a teenager. Um, Osiris was an Egyptian god emperor, son of the sky and the earth, who brought agriculture and therefore life to the world. So it's just got the same um, mission as Osiris Rex, that's seeking to return samples of an asteroid that might contain organics that led to the origin of life on Earth. Now, what about naming Bennu? This is kind of interesting. Um, the uh, asteroid for many years was referred to as 1999 RQ-36. And then um, NASA selected and uh, ran an international contest. Uh, actually, it was the Planetary Society that ran the international contest. Um, and um, a, ninth, a nine year old boy from North Carolina is the one who suggested Bennu. And the reason is because Bennu is an Egyptian mythological bird that was born from the heart of Osiris. Um, and it's associated with the sun and creation and renewal. And also when you take a look at what Osiris Rex looks like, um, it sort of looks like um, the bird. And with the solar panels out, it looks like the bird's um, solar panels. Um, and then if you take a look at the legs of the bird, it almost looks like that, um, what's referred to as a tag sim. We'll learn a little bit more about that in a little while. So that's where um, the, both Osiris um, and um, Bennu uh, names came from. So in terms of building the spacecraft, um, as I said before with the principal investigator, uh, Dante back there, um, you have to have a bunny suit on, so everybody that walks in that room has to have one of those bunny suits. Um, the length of the spacecraft, uh, 20 feet uh, with solar panels deployed. The width is 8 feet, uh, 10 feet in height, which is about the size of a 15 passenger van. And it weighs 1,940 pounds without fuel. So anybody want to take a guess about how much it would how much it would weigh with fuel? Just unmute your mic and let me know. Any thoughts? How much fuel? What what would be the weight of the fuel as they were sending that spacecraft up? No suggestion. More than probably ten or two cars in between. That's my estimate. Okay. All right, you're not too far away from that. Um, it, with fuel, um, the spacecraft actually weighs more than 40,000 pounds or about two and a half tons. So pretty heavy. And uh, you might have seen one of the programs that I did a couple of months ago where we were talking about rockets and how much uh, fuel weighs and why we've got to try to find other sources um, and resources to refuel spacecrafts. Um, all right, so uh, on the spacecraft, uh, there's an awful lot of instruments um, that can, can, can obtain chemical, mineral, and temperature information. Um, the tag sim down at the very bottom is the mechanism that'll be used to acquire the sample. And um, the SAM cam will document the soil acquisition and determine the success of the mission. <clears throat> so there's an awful lot of instrumentation that, that is part of um, the spacecraft. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in a few minutes. Um, so here's the mission timeline. Um, believe it or not, it was 2011 when they decided um, that they were going to uh, go forth on this mission to Bennu. Um, and then, you know, that was nine years ago. And it took them two years to get confirmation that um, it was actually going to happen. Everybody gave their approvals. Um, they started, in, you know, immediately to assemble the spacecraft, which they did in 2015. So only five years ago, they were assembling the spacecraft Osiris-Rex. 
Um, they launched it a year later in September of 2016. And then um, OSIRIS-REx um, arrived at Bedu, which means it was actually um, orbiting around the, the uh, asteroid. Um, two years later, it took two years to get there. Uh, today, as you can see, today is the day that the uh, touchdown onto Bennu is happening. And that was determined a long time ago. And that's why we're doing this presentation tonight is the um, tag, which is the touch and go. That's what it stands for, um, which means that arm will uh, deploy and then touch down on the asteroid, grab some uh, sample soil and then bring it back to earth. But uh, it's gonna be, uh, you know, orbiting uh, Bennu uh, for the next year. And then um, it's not gonna be able to get here for another two years, just like it took two years to get there. So the sample return will happen in uh, 2023. And then it'll take them a couple of years to do some uh, initial analysis of the material that was brought back. Um, here's the launch that happened uh, in September 8th, 2016. I watched it online. I would have loved to have been there at the Kennedy Space Center. Um, I watched one launch take place oh, a long time ago, maybe 30 years ago. Um, and it was just absolutely, absolutely amazing. I watched it from Cocoa Beach, which wasn't too far away from it. Um, and uh, yeah, I would have loved to have seen this one. Anyway, um, here's the first images that came back from the um, OSIRIS-REx spacecraft. And that uh, little dot that circled in green is the first actual images that came back from Bennu. And that happened, um, you know, before, long before it got close enough to get some really good pictures, which you'll see in a few minutes. And that happened um, about two years ago, just a here more than two years ago, we saw the first images of Bennu. Um, here's what we saw when we got 15 miles away from Bennu, a little bit different than um, looking at it 1.4 miles from Bennu. Um, so, you know, the cameras aboard OSIRIS-REx has taken all these pictures. They've done maps of Bennu. What observations can you make about Bennu? Um, as I said, don't use the chat because they really can't see it, but uh, you're welcome to turn on your mic and let me know what you, what do you see there? What does it look like? I'm sure some of you have answered. It's uh, rocky. It's rocky. Okay. What yeah, else? It's very dry. Oh, go ahead. What was that? It looks very dry. It looks very dry. It looks like it had minerals on it. Okay. Minerals. Anything else? Um, well, it has a light source from somewhere. Why do you think it has a light source? Um, well, because it's light on the left and it's dark on the right. Okay. Where do you think that light is coming from? Um, I don't know, maybe the moon. Hmm. Okay, I that, don't one's, know. that one's off a little bit. Yeah, the biggest surprise that um, the NASA scientists uh, determined is that Bennu is very rocky. They actually, their early analysis was they expected that Bennu's surface was gonna be fine grained like a sandy beach. Um, uh -huh. Instead, they found all these boulders, some the size of cars, some of the boulders are the size of houses, a um, couple of the size of football fields. Um, the largest boulder on Bennu is called Ben Ben, and it's as tall as a six-story building. Um, so that sort of is making the whole idea of sample collection much more challenging. So the other thing they found out is that Bennu is active. Um, there's actually plumes of dust and small rocks that have been shooting out of um, the asteroid. 
um, and they've never seen that before. And so this is one of the things that um, they're rather confused about and they still haven't figured out exactly what's going on there, even though they've been, um, you know, analyzing the asteroid for a couple of years now. Um, so the knowing now that um, this, the surface of Bennu was very, very rocky, um, the challenge came in trying to choose a sample site. You know, where are you going to um, land it to be able to kick up some dirt and put it in um, to the spacecraft that's going to be coming back to Earth? So what considerations do you think went into um, choosing a sample site on Bennu? Again, unmute yourself and give me your thoughts. What do you think that they were looking for when they were trying to choose a site on Bennu? Um, a relatively flat surface. Very good. Yeah, definitely. What else? A sample from what minerals or what whatever the asteroid have in it. Yep. It was going to be easy enough to be able to get that sample. You know, one of the big issues is that the um, tag sim can only handle rocks that are no more than two centimeters um, in diameter. So that's about the size of a dime. So it really can't be too rocky. Um, you think there's any other considerations in choosing a sample site? All right, let me go to the next slide. Um, one of the big ones is deliverability. Can the spacecraft actually easily maneuver in and out of the site? You know, if, it's, if there's lots of um, cliffs and rocks and um, big boulders there, can the spacecraft get in there without getting damaged? Um, safety, when the touch and go that's called tag sam is referred to as the touch and gold sample acquisition mechanism head contacts the surface, the spacecraft must avoid any damage. Um, and, you know, that's going to be kind of tricky when you see something that is as rocky as Bennu is. Um, sampleability, um, sample site must have rocks and debris two centimeters or smaller, so tag sam can capture it. And then the science value. You know, uh, does the sample site have what's referred to as pristine regolith um, with a carbon rich, diverse and primitive material and hydrated materials? They wanna know whether or not there is or ever was water on Bennu. Um, I've got uh, a little bit of a video here that'll uh, give you a sense of the four sample sites. Okay, so this was pretty much a challenge. Um, don't forget their original premise, NASA's original premise, was that Bennu was a sandy beach. Um, and, you know, when they got there, it became a little more complicated and they didn't know what to do at first. Um, but there's a couple more videos I'll show you later on uh, that'll give you an idea of how they came up with uh, the different sample sites. So, you know, as you take a look here at the four sample sites, and I'm not sure where the names of the four sample sites came from. I know they had a contest at some point, um, but I don't know what they determined, how they determined what to uh, um, name for the sites, but the, the four sites 
as you can see, we're named after birds. So which sample site would you choose as the primary site and why? Again, unmute your mic and let me know your thoughts here. Which one do you think that they saw as the primary, potential primary site? Thoughts? Yeah, you're not gonna be able to put your answers in the chat. I can't see the chat for some reason. Um, so you're gonna have to unmute your mic and let me know your thoughts. About the osprey. I think osprey, how come? How come? Yeah. Looks the cleanest. It looks like you have to go down uh, little hills all around. It looks like a crater maybe in there. Um, but it looked pretty clean around it as well. And, and, and maybe except for the one um, rock at 12 o'clock, it's pretty okay. clean. Okay, anybody else have a guess? I would choose that one too, because it has the smallest pieces and you said that it could only take things about like two millimeters wide. So it seems what's off. Two centimeters. Two, centimeters. <laughs> <laughs> two meters different. A little bit of a difference there. <laughs> Any other thoughts? Are we two for two? Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we tried. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, the sample site that they chose is actually Nightingale, which is oh. right there on the left. Um, and that was my second option. Yeah, that did, that's actually what I had guessed when I went through this the first time as well. Um, and the reason why they chose Nightingale um, is because there's actually what they've determined to be a small fresh crater um, right in the center. And because they used all this um, spectroscopy equipment, um, they saw that the um, dirt around that area was redder, not blue which means it has a higher color variation. So they expected to be able to find some um, fresh soil there from, uh, from a new crater um, that they expected to be able to find um, more carbon rich materials. So um, the big part of what's happening today is that um, they're using that arm on the bottom of the spacecraft I forgot I had another slide in there. <laughs> so um, we have the uh, site chosen and how do we get the sample? So as I said, the arm that's on the bottom of the spacecraft, uh, which is called uh, TAGSAM, the touch and go sample acquisition mechanism. Um, you can see how big it is there. It's about 11 feet long. It bends um, in about three different locations. And then you can see that there are three nitrogen bottles that are strapped to the arm. And one of the reasons, and you'll see this in a video in a few minutes, is, is that the nitrogen gas is squirted through the head of the tag sam to be able to kick up the dirt um, and the regolith um, on the asteroid to be able to bring it into um, the capture mechanism. So uh, before what they were doing today, um, they actually had two rehearsals, um, one on April 14th and another on August 11th. Um, and here's the view of the tag head from the SAM cam. Um, and uh, at this point, the tag SAM hovered about 130 feet um, above the site. And I just wanted to make sure that the mechanism worked and everything was gonna work the way they planned on it. So uh, here's a video of Tag Sam and how they expect it's gonna work. The arm is ex extending here um, and it's going to you know, move the head in place. And then it's going to touch down for about five to 10 seconds. And the nitrogen gas is going to disrupt the regolith material. 
and they're hoping to collect 60 grams of material. And the material gets collected in those containers on the right and the left side there. Um, and then they're going to take the material, put it in that special capsule up top. Um, and then once it's locked in there, they're gonna close the top of um, the capsule before they send it back to uh, Earth. So, you know, as we said, there's many, many hazards um, with being able to do this maneuver today. Um, if they land at an angle, um, then they're gonna have some real problems and the whole spacecraft might tip over, which could be a total disaster. Uh, we would lose the spacecraft and we would lose everything. Um, so they're using um, an artificial intelligence system um, that is going to orient the uh, spacecraft into the right place. And they have all sorts of hazard maps that they're able to um, look at. Um, and then if it doesn't work, then um, they're going to uh, back up and then they're gonna try again in a couple of days. Um, so here's a, here's a interesting, I really love this video. It's called the challenge of um, tag. As we started to approach Bennu from a distance and it started to fill up the camera field of view, it looked exactly like we thought it would, with a few boulders sticking out. But as we got closer, we expected to see a very sandy surface with maybe a few boulders here and there. And what we saw is very little sand. And we saw these mountains, we saw boulders, we saw rocks, and we saw very few areas that had this sandy surface that we were expecting and what we had designed to. We have never done this before. We're actually gonna collect a sample and bring it back down to Earth for further examination by scientists. In order to achieve that objective, the OSIRIS-REx spacecraft has been navigating around Bennu for about the last two years, studying it in great detail, and also overcoming a number of challenges that Bennu has presented. We were looking for locations on Bennu that were 50 meters in diameter, relatively flat, and covered with fine grain material. And by fine grain material, I mean stuff that's the size of a dime or smaller. We realized that there were no sites on Bennu that even came close to meeting this criteria. Everywhere we looked was too small and covered with boulders. So we actually had to fly a number of additional close passes over the asteroid and rethink our entire plan for grabbing the sample. After the additional observations of Bennu, we had to down select to four sites and then go back and survey those sites even further to select the final primary sample site. My first impression of Nightingale is that's the last place I wanted to go. But as we started looking at other sites, we saw that one, this is probably one of the most sampleable sites. And two, we were overperforming in our navigation capability and our ability to contact. Natural feature tracking works a lot like the human mind in that we pick up landmarks along the way. As we descend, we look at features on the ground. We program the computer to recognize certain features. It takes a picture, says this feature is not where I expected it to be. It's a little bit off to the side. Updates its position based on where it's pointed and where that feature shows up in the camera position. The tag event is our touch and go event, which is where we'll actually be retrieving the sample from asteroid Bennu. We start with a series of maneuvers, one of them being the checkpoint burn, which is where we'll actually check our position velocity in relation to the sample site. And then the match point burn, about 10 minutes later, will zero out our horizontal velocity relative to the surface. And then about 10 minutes after that, we make contact with the tag SAM, fire the gas bottle, and then back away. And we hope to get at least 60 grams of sample, and then we'll be able to store that and bring it back down to Earth. But there are several things that could go wrong, and we also have to be prepared that we won't be successful on our first try at Nightingale. We don't only get one shot at TAG. We actually have three nitrogen bottles on board the spacecraft, so we can potentially do three TAG attempts if needed. We go through several what-if scenarios, and this is how we actually prepare for a lot of our contingencies. So we've had to look all around the surface and identify the rocks and boulders that if the spacecraft were to tip over up to 25 degrees, 
it could come into contact and be damaged. We had to develop a hazard map, which we program into the computer and says, if you're getting too close to those hazards, we'll do a wave off, we'll back away from the asteroid, we'll come back and do this another day. Everything might work perfectly. We come down, we touch the surface just where we want to, we fire the gas bottle, but the area we contact is covered in large rocks. Those rocks would prevent any fine grain material from being stirred up and captured in the tag sand head. Another similar scenario is if the tag sand were to touch on the edge of a boulder and become tipped up. In that case, when the gas bottle fires, much of that gas escapes out the side, not churning up the material that we want to capture. The day of tag is going to be really exciting, but the excitement for our team doesn't end there. We have to verify that we have a proper sample. First, we're gonna image the tag SAM head by sticking it in front of one of the cameras. Then we're gonna do a maneuver called the sample mass measurement in which we stick out the arm and we spin the spacecraft in order for us to decide if we've collected enough mass to be able to stow the sample and return home or if we have to try again. This is the culmination uh, of a lot of work. It's probably one of the most exciting missions that I've worked on. It is really exciting to know that we're finally gonna be able to touch the surface of the asteroid and collect the sample to return back to Earth. Okay, so now you get a really good sense of some of the problems um, that could potentially happen today during this um, touch and go um, mission of OSIRIS-REx on the asteroid Bennu. So this is um, this slide is one that I actually just captured a couple of hours ago from the NASA website. And this is sort of like a to-do list. Um, so it's, you know, the SLU uh, spacecraft to burn at attitude, the orbit departure maneuver, extend the tag sim arm to sampling position. So these are all the things that have to happen in the order that they have to happen in order for this to be successful. And as you can see, down near the bottom, third from the bottom, um, it's the touchdowns, sampling in progress, um, sampling complete, back away, burn complete and then retract the tag sim arm to the park position. So um, I did not know till about a week ago that um, what time today uh, this all was taking place. And it actually was taking place um, at 6.15 Eastern time tonight. Um, so we were sort of watching as some of this programming had started to see what was going on. Um, my sidekick Grady over here was watching the NASA channel live um, to get uh, <laughs> a uh, uh, minute by minute uh, report to me of what was going on. And so, you know, at 5.51, it started, uh, the uh, OSIRIS-REx started to descend. Um, there was a match point burn to completion at 6.01, um, which meant it was gonna be 10 minutes to surface contact. Um, the touch and go configuration had to be controlled. Uh, by the way, when you take a look at the slide there and it says slew spacecraft, what that's referring to is the orientation of the spacecraft relative to where it wants to be um, on the surface of Bennu. Um, so, you know, we got some word at um, when it was below 25 meters at 6.08 p.m., when it was below five meters um, at 6.11, um, and then it was a go far tag. However, there's one problem, and that is that it takes 18 and a half minutes to get the information in any one direction. So if, you know, NASA wanted to uh, tell uh, OSIRIS-REx to abort the mission, um, it's going to take 18 and a half minutes to tell it that. And the same thing, you know, it's going to take 18 and a half minutes once we know whether or not something happened. Um, so at 6.13 tonight, you can applaud now. The sample collection was complete. <laughs> Yay! Um, and it appears that uh, it worked the um, spacecraft uh, uh, went off the, off the asteroid. Um, at that point, uh, it was losing power um, because it had functioned for 
quite a long time uh, without um, its wings being recharged. Um, so it uh, retracted um, back away from the asteroid. Um, they will not know, NASA will not know for at least a day, maybe two days, whether or not they got the 60 meters of material or 60 grams of material that they were looking to gather. Um, there's going to be um, a press conference tomorrow night sometime. Um, I don't know if they'll have some at five o'clock tomorrow. Um, they should have some preliminary information about whether or not they got any material whatsoever um, into the collection plate. Um, but it's probably, they're thinking it's really gonna take 48 hours before they um, know whether they really have what they wanted to get. Um, if not, uh, as you heard in the video, there's another two opportunities to be able to touch down at other places to try to get that done. So, um, you know, I'm sure you're going to hear a lot of information about it, but now you understand what's happening. So then um, after about a year from now, then um, we're talking about the sample return capsule. And let's take a look at what that might look like. So OSIRIS-REx is coming back towards the planet, um, releases the uh, return capsule, the dome only part uh, comes back and it'll land um, in Utah. There's a test range in Utah and uh, hopefully the parachutes will deploy like that um, and be able to land um, at the Utah test range. Um, then what'll happen is um, there's a recovery uh, vehicle and you can see in the upper left hand um, photo there uh, what the sample return capsule looks like in terms of size to a human being um, and that's the vehicle that will transport it back um, to a, uh, a portable clean room um, and then it'll be transported to the Houston uh, Johnson Space Center um, when uh, they are building a new lab for this to, to be able to do all this analysis um, and what's going to happen first in the lab. Um, they're you know, outfitting it right now and they're going to be doing rehearsals. What you see in the upper right hand corner um, is uh, what's referred to as a glove box. And so what happens is you put your hands in um, those two things that look like uh, rubber tubes. And uh, that way you're not touching and contaminating the material that's come back from the asteroid. Um, and everything inside that box is filled with nitrogen, which, is be, which will be the, the least um, impact or have the least impact um, on the materials. Um, and then from there, um, you know, it'll go to the lab. They'll do a lot of characterization of the return material, which means, you know, what type of chemicals does it include? What type of rocks is it? Um, how old are the rocks? Things of that nature. Um, then they'll build a catalog of the return material. Um, and then they'll do more curation of this at the NASA's Johnson Space Center. And you can see what they've been doing already with astro materials um, at the Johnson Space Center. It goes back to 1969 when the uh, material came back from uh, the moon and uh, various sites on the moon. So that, that's all down at the Johnson Space Center. Um, in the Antarctic, there are meteorites that are always um, landing in the Antarctic, Antarctic and um, they're looking at those materials. Um, there's some cosmic dust uh, up in the stratosphere. Um, there's a couple of uh, missions that have already happened over the past um, 15 years. You know, the solar wind one, uh, a comet, um, stardust, uh, exploration. The Hayabusa um, asteroid mission um, 
is part of a Japanese mission to do um, exactly what we're trying to do with Bennu right now, which is to collect material from um, the uh, Raigu um, asteroid and bring it back to Earth at some point. But you can see the photos down bottom. Um, in the far left, you can see what it looks like to have your arm in those glove boxes. Um, they're, as I said, they're, I think they're made of rubber, um, but that way you're not actually touching the material. Um, and then they're looking carefully at all that stuff. And there's the new um, curation lab for the material there in the bottom right hand corner. Um, so if you want to find out more material, more information about the OSIRIS-REx mission um, and what happened this afternoon and what's going to happen over the next couple of days and next couple of years, um, you can, you know, go to asteroidmission.org um, or nasa.gov, um, OSIRIS-REx. Um, they have a Facebook page and Twitter and YouTube and all sorts of other things. Um, I've got one more video that I really want to show you that sort of encapsulates everything that I've just been talking about for the past hour. Oops. Over 200 million miles away from Earth, NASA's OSIRIS-REx spacecraft is preparing for an ambitious sample collection attempt at asteroid Bennu. Before it makes its approach to the rocky surface, let's take a look back at some of the incredible firsts for this mission, which almost seem like something out of a Hollywood movie. This is the first asteroid sample return mission for NASA, and it could be the largest return from space since the Apollo astronauts brought moon samples back to Earth. While getting set to grab a sample, OSIRIS-REx has set not one, but two Guinness World Records. It's first for the smallest ever body orbited, and its second for the closest orbit of a spacecraft. This tight orbit has brought the spacecraft so close to Bennu that OSIRIS-REx's onboard cameras and laser altimeter have been able to image and characterize the asteroid's surface and shape better than Earth, our own moon, or any other celestial body. OSIRIS-REx has imaged Bennu down to five centimeter per pixel resolution providing us with an unprecedented view into this rocky and boulder-filled world. With 28 onboard thrusters, OSIRIS-REx is one of the most maneuverable spacecrafts. This allows it to carefully and precisely descend to a spot on Bennu that is no larger than a few parking spaces. There have certainly been some unexpected twists along the way. However, OSIRIS-REx has capitalized on these moments. Right after arriving at the asteroid, OSIRIS-REx imaged rocky ejecta that has been bursting off Bennu. This is the first time we have been able to observe the entire life cycle of a natural satellite ejecting off an object, entering into orbit, and returning back to the surface. Because of Bennu's extremely rocky surface, the team needed to adapt the spacecraft's navigation method to an optical approach known as Natural Feature Tracking, or NFT. This is the first time this approach has been used in space, and it will allow OSIRIS-REx to steer itself down to collect a sample from Bennu. And now, OSIRIS-REx is looking to set another first for NASA. Successfully collect a sample of an asteroid and deliver it to Earth by 2023. Hey, you know, I have a ton of thank yous that I really have to um, mention right now. Um, I have a great time. I really, really enjoy um, my affiliation with NASA and the Solar System Ambassador Program through the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. If it wasn't for that, um, for them, I wouldn't be having as much fun as I do. Um, my partners in crime here who um, have helped me to uh, and allowed me to produce this, especially during STEM week, um, the Brockton Area Branch of the NAACP and the Brockton Public Library and um, our sponsor, Jacobs. Um, do want to mention as a NASA JPL Solar System Ambassador, I am a volunteer. And although I go through a great deal of training, the opinions expressed in this presentation are my own, except that which is fact. And that 
is what I have to say. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you, Pat. Yay, thank, thank you. you. Awesome presentation, Pat. I learned some stuff. I was going to say Nightingale. <laughs> <laughs> it was great. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Um, no, I, I think Mark wants to be uh, get involved in astronomy. So um, I, th I think hopefully you enjoyed it, Mark, huh? Um, and look at my other friends there. That's great. Um, yeah, this was, it was really exciting as Grady was sitting here giving me the play by play as, you know, this whole thing started and it's like, what is happening? But um, he you could see all sorts of, uh, let me see. You see the notes? Whatever. No. Anyways, uh, lots of notes about what was happening minute by minute. Um, but uh, yeah, this is a great day. For some reason, I have this real fascination with um, asteroids. And um, I've watched this mission from the very beginning. And I'm pretty excited about the fact that um, it all took place. And it was an apparent success. We'll find out for certain uh, mm -hmm. tomorrow or the day after. Um, but it appears that uh, at the very least, it um, touched down on the surface of Bennu and it appears to have worked. <laughs> Pat, I think you can be known as on the spot space reporter. Yeah. yeah. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> um, questions, comments, thoughts, you know. Uh, We've got. I actually just have. I have a question about the actual spacecraft. This, uh, this is Karen, by the way. Yeah. Um, what what is it happened to it when the uh, samples return to Earth? Does it just go up in the atmosphere? Or you know, it's funny. That was one of the things I had thought of earlier today that I was going to do a little research on. I <laughs> honestly do not know the answer to that. Um, and it's funny because I've probably participated in. Um, let me see. Uh, maybe six or seven different um, webinars from NASA, and nobody has ever asked that question. Hmm. Good question, Karen. <laughs> we'll have to check it out. <laughs> yeah, very definitely. Yeah. Um, what else now? Ivanji, did you have a call? Oh, Bordine had a question. Sure, go ahead. Um, so you, the active, like, meteor, like, is that dangerous? Like, does it have implications for us? Like, what if it hit us? You mean the asteroid? Oh yeah, sorry, asteroid. <laughs> um, yeah, it has real uh, serious implications. Um, it's one of the asteroids that they've been watching for several years. Um, and uh, it's quite possible in a hundred years from now that um, if they don't do something to deflect um, or otherwise mitigate um, the issues uh, with uh, Bennu that it could come and cause really catastrophic damage to Earth. Here's that thing they talked about today. If you want to chime in, Grady, you're welcome to. Um, so yeah, that's one of the things that um, NASA has put a lot of focus for the last maybe five years on what they refer to as asteroid mitigation or near earth object mitigation strategies. And one of the other, um, Ivanji, I think maybe you, you actually participated in one of the other events I've had about asteroids on asteroid day this year um, that actually talked about the different mitigation strategies. Uh, for oh yeah, like with um, a shieldish thing where it like bounces it away. Yeah. And like also using like gravity to pull it into another mm -hmm. direction. Yep. Good. Look at that. He was listening to what I was saying. Great. <laughs> I mean, I just arrived. So. <laughs> thanks. Thanks so much, Pat. I learned so much about something I knew absolutely nothing about, which is asteroids. <laughs> and now I feel very knowledgeable. Thank you. Thank you. Well, if you're around in 100 years, you probably will be very grateful that you've learned so much. <laughs> uh, Grady, did you have something to input? I'm, I'm looking right now. I got an article earlier today. I don't know if you can hear me or not because I didn't set my machine up to talk to. 
uh, talk through it. Uh, right now, there is an article somewhere about um, uh, the next NASA project about that particular thing. And they've got this white box and it looks like it's about, I don't know, two feet cubicle. Um, and uh, there's a big article about it, but the problem is I can't find the article from Wired Magazine that showed up on my uh, Blackberry about it this morning. It's very sad, I lost it. <laughs> oh, no. You do have a pretty bad text. That is only because there's two computers side by side on the same table. Yeah. Um, I will mute myself now. <laughs> Catherine, did you have any questions or um, comments or anything? Catherine? Well, as someone said, uh, I happen to think I knew something about asteroids, but this was such a fantastic program that you've run, Pat, that it certainly has multiplied many times the knowledge I now have of asteroids. And I agree with you that um, TAG video was wonderful. It's, you know, I, I work very hard to try to take, you know, space science is very complex. Sure. Uh, and as a solar system ambassador, I have hundreds, I'm not kidding you, hundreds of webinars and information sessions I can take every month. Um, and, you know, it's a, we talk about curation and curating these materials back in the Johnson Space Center. But I have to curate the material that I present to you, you know, and how do I present it in such a way that doesn't talk down to you, but helps you understand it. Um, and then I probably had 1500 videos to choose from. Yeah. Um, it was just really you, incredible. You uh, chose well. <laughs> Thank you. Is there anything that, that any, any of you don't understand or didn't understand? Or would like more information about. I, I have one more question. In, uh -oh. in light of our in, <laughs> in light of our current situation, um, you probably know this one. Um, the um, the sample. There was a lot of talk about the sample coming back and all the measures taken to protect the sample from contamination. Um, is there a thought these days about the other way around? like protecting us from yeah, that's whatever. that's one of the big questions that I actually asked in my in the last two webinars I participated in um, and uh, they actually over the last four or five years have taken more care to make sure that you know there's less contamination or less possibilities of contamination in either direction um, mm -hmm. this is why you know you see uh, even with this the the um, uh, sample space capsule coming back to Earth. Um, there's going to be all sorts of bunny suits out there uh, putting it into a clean room on the truck immediately. Um, and, you know, and then that's being sealed inside of, you know, a, a big case. Now, <laughs> anything can happen at any point, you know, right. <laughs> um, you know, they're trying to prevent it from escape any air from escaping it or getting into there. Um, and, uh, I don't know, <laughs> we'll find out in 20 years when things start growing all over the normal no, kidding. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, it's, I, I was assured there was a, a real, um, detailed conversation um, about that topic in the last couple of webinar, webinars I was okay. a part of. Okay, so there are me me extreme measures probably taken uh, yes. uh, to protect from both directions. Right, right? exactly. Well, yeah. that's good to know. Very conscious I, mean, we... I just wish more kids could see this. It's so fascinating and uh, especially right now where kids can't be in school, watching live things, it, to, to see this is just wonderful. So I wish it could go out to schools. 
Yeah, it's, um, you know, I sent something out to um, all the Brockton Public Schools and the schools in the area. Um, Ivanji uh, released the information to his biology professor, a uh, biology teacher, um, who will probably be participating in Thursday's uh, event. Um, but we will have this on the Brockton Library Facebook page and on the Mr. Science Fair Facebook page. Um, the uh, Brockton Community Cable Access will be putting this on their YouTube channel. Uh, so there will be a lot of opportunities to uh, be able to have other people watch this and, you know, hopefully, um, you know, some of the teachers will be able to pass it along to their students. This is Grady. Um, on October 15th, one of my favorite magazines, Wired Magazine, had an article called How to Build a Spacecraft to Save the World. Wired paid a visit to NASA's first probe designed to protect Earth from killer asteroids. It launches next year. It's a really, really good article. Unfortunately, because it's in a magazine, they kind of want to get your money before they'll let you read the whole thing. But since I'm a subscriber, I've got it and it's pages and pages of information. But here's the really interesting thing. Um, I just did a search and it says here, republicworld.com, which is a website that kind of follows this stuff had an article on September 28th called Killer Asteroid Hitting Earth in 2022, question mark. Here's what NASA says, and they've got a name for it. Didymos, D-I-D-Y-M-O-S, approaching Earth in October of 2022. So it looks like NASA will be launching something next year that may be able to deal with this asteroid that's going to be approaching Earth in 2022. So we should increase our funding for NASA. I'm all for that one. Um, yeah, yeah. The, um, as Ivanji had mentioned, uh, you know, back on uh, June 30th, I did a program for Asteroid Day that uh, talked about uh, the four major uh, mitigation strategies that not only NASA, but there's an organization called the B612 Foundation that I'm one of the founding members of. Um, and it was created by um, astronaut Ed Liu, um, who, when he came back from, you know, his several missions into space and on the International Space Station, uh, had decided that he had, they had gone over the moon so many times and he saw the number of craters and how much destruction was done on the moon from the craters that he came back to earth just totally convinced and something had to be done about it so he created this uh uh 612 foundation um to help with the mitigation strategies but yeah. some of it um does relate to you know sending nuclear weapons out <laughs> but mm -hmm. if that shatters an asteroid gee, do you want, you know, a thousand pieces of asteroid coming at us? Um, <laughs> that one scares a lot of people. Um, there's also um, this big net that they're talking about wrapping around the asteroid and moving it out of, you know, the orbit of Earth. But, you know, the one thing people don't realize is it doesn't take much um, of a push to get that asteroid out of Earth's atmosphere or in, into a different orbit that's not gonna impact Earth. Um, so because they've been working on this now for, as I said, about five or six years, um, they're aware of it. Now, the big problem is there are some asteroids that they don't see um, as they're trying to find them. And you know, sometimes asteroids hide during the daytime. Um, and that's why we've seen some uh, fireballs called bowl leads, um, you know, coming uh, like the one in Russia a couple of years ago, you know, that caught a lot of people by surprise. And then, as I said, um, Neil, deGrasse, Neil deGrasse Tyson thinks that there's a, a um, refrigerator sized asteroid that is possibly coming towards Earth 
on November 2nd, the day before election day, which is hysterical for a lot of reasons. <laughs> <laughs> Enough said. <laughs> Ivanji, did you have something to, to add? Or are you just talking to your mom? <laughs> No, I was just saying it'd be really good. It's kind of really funny how that works. Because I mean, like, it's really coincidental. <laughs> yeah. uh, uh, whatever. Mark, do you have any questions? You're our Mr. Astronomy wannabe. <laughs> well, I kind of have a question about the samples. Like, what type of particles or gases or metals are in the particles of the asteroid? Um, that's what they need to find out. You know, they've done a lot of um, spectrometry, spectrometry, okay, it's late. Um, <laughs> and, you know, so they have a, a, a general idea of, you know, what uh, materials uh, are on the asteroid. But until they actually get it to Earth and use some of the um, tools and instruments that we have here on Earth, um, you know, they only have a rough idea of what it is. Um, so it's going to be very interesting. We probably aren't going to know for a solid three years. Um, you know, it's kind of tough to wait. Um, it's like, I want to know now. Um, but uh, it's going to take, as I said, uh, Osiris Rex is going to orbit Bennu for another year before it starts getting back to Earth. And the reason for that is because there's a window um, of time to both launch a rocket um, and return a rocket um, so that it takes um, the best the shortest amount of time to actually uh, be able to go to and from most efficiently. Yeah, it's a, not just a time issue, but it's a fuel issue. Pat's exactly right. Um, they planned something like this years in advance to be able to return the, the OSIRIS-REx spacecraft to Earth on a path that uses so little energy that they have a surplus of fuel in case they need it on the approach to Earth to still safely get the payload here. The more fuel they use to uh, get the spacecraft back to Earth, the less they have if at the last minute they have to make some kind of adjustment. Yeah, this is, uh, um, uh, there, there's a phrase I'm looking for. It befuddles me right now. Um, Mark, We've I, all been there. Yeah. We've all <laughs> been at the point where we're about out of gas. <laughs> our, our car is telling us we've <laughs> run out of gas and we need to get two more miles to the next exit where the gas station is. We don't want to be in that position with this spacecraft. That's for sure. Um, Mark, I know that didn't completely answer your question, but did it answer your question enough or do you have another one? Well, that, that answered my question, but uh, I, was, I was thinking of another one about um, when it, what, uh, what time do uh, does the shuttle land on it, and is it going to be live? Well, it actually, the um, Osiris Rex actually touched down this afternoon at 6.15. Um, and, uh, you know, it supposedly did what it was supposed to and brought the sample of the material back into the spacecraft, and then the spacecraft left the, the close orbit of the, the planet so that it could recharge um, its solar panels. Um, but they're not going to know for sure whether or not it really worked the way they think it did for another day or two. Oh, okay. So it did happen. It happened from their perspective. It happened successfully um, just about the time we started this program here. Um, and uh, that's pretty exciting. 
Okay, thank you. So, so Pat, here's a question for you. What was the time that you quoted earlier for how long it takes for communication to get to Earth from where Bennu is? 18 and a half minutes. Okay. 6.15 was the time that we knew what happened that many minutes earlier. Right. And the really important thing here is if we needed to actually send a command to the spacecraft to tell it to abort, we had already lost the opportunity to do that a couple of minutes after six and everything that happened, happened after we had no way to interact with it because speed of light. Yeah. There, there is a really bad echo from your microphone grating. No, it's, I'm in this room yeah. with you. Oh, wait. Your mic sounds like me up. He sounds like the man behind the curtain. <laughs> 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 Pretty much. <laughs> that right there. Um, yeah, that 18 and a half minutes, uh, you know, there's, if anything went wrong, there's nothing they could have done to recover. It would have been far too late at that point by the time we um, got that information. Um, so that's why they had to practice, you know, they went through two trial runs to see how it was going to work. Um, they had all the um, videos from it, all the photos from it. Um, you know, they weren't taking any, well, they weren't taking too many chances, let's put it that way. Um, but anything could have happened as it was going down. Stephanie, you're pretty quiet. You have anything to add? I'm just listening. <laughs> yeah, but you've listened to a couple of my other NASA presentations. And so by, by now, I would think that you were an expert. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, oh, did you fall asleep again? <laughs> no. <laughs> I'm only teasing you. <laughs> so, um, Ellie, is there anybody else in your household who has anything else, has anything to say about this? Uh, I love the photo you sent me. Well, there is. Is there a way to show the photo? Because this was a really exciting night for her. <laughs> As opposed to last night where she only listened. Uh, way to show it? Um, I, I, You're the techie, not me. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Oh, uh. Let's see if I can. I wish I could I to do that because it was so good. Yeah. If I if I can. Let's see, I'm not quite certain. Put that in there. Yeah. Maybe we if I texted you a quick message, that might do it, right? Well, you texted me the photo. I texted um, you the photo. Yeah. And so I'm going to go back up. Um. Let's see if I can capture it and uh, share it. There we go. Well, actually, I might be able to. Um, this might work here. Come on. Let's see if I can share this. There we go. All right. <laughs> there she is. <laughs> when there was clapping, she sat right up. <laughs> so um, there's our buddy Maggie, who apparently really enjoyed the presentation tonight. She'll be. She'll be on board on Thursday. I'm not sure she can make it tomorrow, but. Okay. Well, she might get scared tomorrow by all the orangutans and gorillas. Oh, she might growl too. <laughs> <laughs> That's a distinct possibility. <laughs> um, this is else? the fun of working remotely. Yeah. So, oops, there's, okay. No, nope, I'm going in the wrong direction. There we go. 
So there's uh, I, virus rex. I don't know if my message came out, but I got to run. But oh, okay. um, it's a great program. It's great to see you, Pat. And Thank Grady, you. even if it's just a picture. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Talk Karen. Thanks okay. for joining us. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Yeah, bye -bye. Bye -bye. All right. Laura Dean, do you have any questions? She's quiet. What's going on? Uh, sorry, my computer was acting up. Um, but um, I don't have any more questions. Okay. That's cool. And who's behind the Jennifer McDonald? Um, I don't know who's there. Don't want to show yourself, huh? Okay. All right. Well, um, I think unless anybody has any um, final questions or comments, um, I'm going to go get dinner. Yes, nothing else going once, going twice, twice. Thank you all for joining us. Um, I really enjoy doing the space presentations, especially if they uh, revolve around asteroids. Um, and I think this mission in particular is just so incredible to, you know, it was one thing, you know, bringing material back from the moon um, back in 1969, you know, it was, you know, but the moon's not that far away from us. Um, and the material isn't that tremendously different from anything that um, we would uh, expect to find here. How uh, long is a trip to the moon? Well, um, it's, let me see if I can do this. Moon is probably two days. Wow, yeah. that's the, oh, I don't know, that's kind of crazy, I'm going to be honest. <laughs> and how far away is, or like, how long was the trip to Asteroid been in? Uh, two years. Dang, you can see the heavy contrast. Yeah, and the same thing with Mars, you know, the uh, space rover that's going to Mars right now, that's a seven or eight months. month right, trip. Yeah. Yeah. So um, that's how much further out Bennu is. Um, and so, you know, you know that there's a very strong possibility the materials you're gonna find on Bennu uh, might be not anything like we see here on earth. Um, you know, how do we classify it? How do we determine what it is? Uh, there's one picture I did not show uh, where on a part of Bennu, there are some, um, what appears to be white rocks in one particular area. And they've determined through the um, instrumentation examination um, that that's actually part of one of the other asteroids, the, the asteroid Vesta. Um, and it's the spectroscopy and all the other examinations of um, that material on Bennu shows it, as I said, to be from uh, asteroid Vesta. So what they're thinking happened is that at some point, um, an asteroid or another, you know, uh, heavenly body uh, crashed into um, uh, Vesta, and the material went flying out and got close enough to Bennu. And even though Bennu doesn't have much of a gravitational pull, um, it had enough to bring down that material. <coughs> So things like that are just, it's fascinating science for me in particular. But one of these days, maybe I'll go on a space trip. <laughs> no. <laughs> if I wasn't going to go when I was uh, 18 years old, I don't think I'm going to go right now. <laughs> All right. Any other questions? Going once, going twice. Thank you, folks. Really, really appreciate um, your time and attention. Okay. You're welcome. Tomorrow night, we have two more programs. Tomorrow night is going to be really fun with. Uh, yeah, what it always, oh, it's the penguins, right? Well, the penguins is at five o'clock, and the penguins has a different registration. So if you. Oh, yeah. So if you want to watch the penguins, you 
need to uh, sign up through that other registration form. But then at six o'clock, um, uh, Laura Bayer is going to be doing the um, program where she's an educator with the um, New England Primate Conservancy. And it's going to be a fun program about all sorts of primates and climate change and things of that nature. So it's going to be cool. And then Thursday night, Ivanji is going to be. Um, and, St and Stephanie here. Oh, yeah, that's right. And Stephanie and Isabel, who has not joined us. But that's because she's working on her science project. So I yep. guess. Um, but Stephanie and Ivanji will be the moderators for Thursday night on the two career panels. Stephanie, and, have you been looking at the Google Doc? Uh, no, but I will. I had to get through tonight. I really did. Yeah, because me and Isabel. Isabel already filled it out. We're just waiting for Stephanie's. Yeah, I'm going to do it tonight. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. You got ch challenged by um, one of your um, peers. How's that? Cats do horrible things to hair. <laughs> All right. Um, so tomorrow night, six o'clock, unless you want to get involved in the penguin program. And if you want to um, talk with Jean or watch Jean Pennycook, who's the author of a book called Waiting for Joey. Um, Jean has uh, spent 15 years um, going up to um, Antarctica for two and a half months every single summer um, to do a study on penguins. And she's got 15 years worth of stories and photos and all sorts of other information that's really fascinating. So if you want the link to that, uh, let me know and I'll send it to you. Um, if not, then um, six o'clock, we hope you'll come back and join us for that program. And then um, Thursday night, six o'clock, Banji and Stephanie front and center. All right, thank you all. Um, bye I'll bye. see you hopefully in the next day or two. Bye bye now. Okay, bye. 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 Thanks, Mark. Yeah.